Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor. In case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host, and the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now today, uh, I want to share with you a brief review of our vacation that Sally and I took. Now before you groan too much about having to look at an endless slideshow with narration, I promise I'll only provide with a few photos and they, they do relate to today's scripture. The place we visited is the final destination of Christian pilgrimages that are made by the thousands each year. Santiago de Compostela. Pilgrims travel by various means, including walking to the cathedral at this place to attend a mass commemorating their pilgrimage. Now here's a map with the destination shown in the far northwest corner of Spain. The main pilgrimage route to Santiago follows an earlier Roman trade route which continues to the Atlantic coast of Spain's Galicia province, ending at Cape Finisterre, which is Latin for the end of the world. Because if you stand at that place and look outside, all you see is ocean. So of course it's the end of the world. Sally and I were not able to complete an official pilgrimage since we arrived by bus from our ship and then walked only the final 500 yards to the city and the cathedral. To complete an official pilgrimage, one must walk a minimum of 100 kilometers, which is 62 miles, or use a bicycle. If if you use a bicycle, you have to complete 200 kilometers. But why a Christian pilgrimage in this place, Spain, so far from Jerusalem in the Holy Land? Well, the simple answer is that the remains of the Apostle James are located here created and established after the discovery of the relics of St. James at the beginning of the ninth century. The way of St. James became a major pilgrimage route for medieval Christianity from the 10th century onwards. Pope Alexander in 1500 officially declared the Camino de Santiago to be one of the three great pilgrimages of Christendom, along with those who are bound for Jerusalem or Rome. Other world issues during the years since it was inaugurated have led to rises and falls in participation. But it's been recently, in the 1990s, I guess that's still recently, even though it's 30 years ago, uh, that the pilgrimage to Santiago regained the popularity it had in the Middle Ages. In fact, our Bishop Chris is looking forward to a time when he can complete such a pilgrimage. Next photo, please. Here is a picture of the inside of the cathedral that the people uh, will go to to attend. You can't tell because it's a little bit of a dark slide, but there is some, a mammoth organ uh, in that cathedral. Uh, 
But uh, so now you ask, is this location how is this location related to today's message? Well, the relationship has to do with James, one of Christ's apostles. And every year on July 25th, the church commemorates the Apostle James and using the same scripture readings each year. The gospel text for July 25th is from Mark chapter 10, and some of which states, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, Well, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. In other words, the apostles James and John were making a presumptuous request of Jesus because they felt they were favored by him and doubtless were perfectly sincere in professing their willingness to follow the master to any suffering that he might endure. To the disciples, these metaphors may have conveyed the thought of a messianic <coughs> battle and they professed themselves willing to fight in it. As for the rewards for which they asked, these were not Jesus to bestow. Jesus said, these are prepared by God. And wanting to be like Gentile rulers, they understood leadership in terms of commanding slaves and exacting service from them. But Jesus knows that's not the way in the kingdom of God. The person who wants to be first must take the lowest place and serve his fellows. And this is not a recipe for success in this life, it is a command to find happiness and service instead of being served. In loving others instead of com commanding them. It finds its inspiration in the example of Jesus himself. So it's not a recipe for success in this life. It's a command to find happiness in service instead of being served. In loving others instead of commanding them. It finds its inspiration in the example of Jesus himself. And as for James, well, if you're not aware, he was the first of the, apostle, the apostles to give his life. Acts 11 describes how he was <clears throat> beheaded by Herod in Jerusalem. And this is another of the readings for that July 25th commemoration date that's held every year. So again, how does it fit in with today's gospel. Today's gospel from Luke, we see a similar situation. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. So how do we apply that to our lives today? Well, <clears throat> Jesus is eating a Sabbath meal at the home of one of the leaders of the Pharisees, and the other guests are watching him closely. They see him heal a sick man and send him away. That's described in the verses that were not read today in, in the Gospel. Then to discover that Jesus is also watching them closely, he calls their attention to their own efforts to seek honor for themselves and for each other. As the guests claim the seats of distinction and the host invites only those who have the means to reciprocate. <laughs> this phenomenon can still be seen today when we want others to see us in the reserved first class, private box, members only, elite club seats, with people of influence in this world. It is to us seeking to exalt ourselves in this way that Jesus addresses us. Our behavior betrays the fact that we, are, that we make gods of ourselves and out of those who can enhance our reputation or further our ambitions. We don't consider those who have nothing to give us worthy of our attention. We value the praise and the company of those who have power in this world because we think they can give us a share in their power and influence. But we are not gods. The honor that we can give and take from each other belongs to the empire of this world, not to God's empire. Ultimately, the real God is the real host of this meal of life, and we're all guests together. 
Jesus is in the role of divine host when he welcomes and heals a sick man. He warns us that God will come to us who have exalted ourselves into the places of honor and say to you, give this person your seat. In the very telling of his parable, Jesus strips us of our honor and clothes us with shame of our self-seeking assessments of who has dignity at God's meal and who does not. God honors those who can only receive and not repay, whose company is no boost to our power, our reputation, and our influence. In God's empire, the first becomes last, and the last becomes first. God gathers up those in the lowest places by taking the lowest place himself, stripping divine honor and all things away and becoming a naked human baby from a poor family. Grown up, this human Jesus, hated by those whose idolatry he exposes, was stripped again of clothing, honor, and all dignities when he was crucified. In the tomb, Jesus joined the disgraced at the bottom end of the table, those who are sent there either by others or by God. From there, God raised him to the very head of the table to be invested once again with the honor of the Son of God as host. God gives us everything, God gives up everything to befriend human beings and to invite them to come up higher. There is room at the table even for those who have been previously humbled. The one who was killed is made alive. In God's empire, the first become last and the last first. And we can look and trust this God who has honored us humans by becoming one of us and who feeds us with his own life. And the page won't turn. <laughs> he feeds us with his own life through bread and wine. Jesus has given us his very spirit so we know that God will give us everything that we need, no matter how impossible or undeserved. We do not need to seek honor from others to expect them to sustain us in return for our recognition of them. They are not God and we are not God. Thanks be to God. Knowing <clears throat> that we have everything flowing from God to us, we are free to turn our attention and generosity to those who can give us nothing equivalent in return. When we do that, we find that by inviting the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind to share our lives and our abundance, that God gives us so much more than the equivalent in return. We find ourselves among the people <clears throat> whom God has invited to the feast and wishes to honor. We are raised with those last ones into the empire of God in the resurrection of the righteous one, Jesus, who makes us righteous with him. <clears throat> and so these thoughts tie to what Jesus said in the Markin text that's used for the commemoration day of James. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wishes to become first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So now that we know what we're asking for, the request changes. Ask not what Jesus can do for you. Ask what you can do for Jesus. This is not just a change in leadership, but a systemic change in the politics of life. It's a whole new kingdom where the position of honor is at the end of the line. A word where we're not in it for what we can get, or what, <clears throat> but we're in it to see what we can give. The power to receive is the power to serve as Jesus served us. And by giving whatever he asks, even our lives, for the sake of the gospel. And so as James gave his, gave his life, we are also asked to give up our lives as we know them. Let us pray. Jesus, teach us to forsake our ways, to humble ourselves, to kneel at your feet, and live out your way of compassion.
Amen.